you are more likely to meet somebody that has climbed Mount Everest than has swum across the English Channel. In this video, I'm gonna answer some of your questions about what it's like to swim from England to France. channel is not like a swimming pool so as soon as I could I got into open water uh, we hired a house on the Kenyan coast and there I'd go out and swim into the sea and you know I'd, I'd swim out past the breakers and spend two three four hours just swimming in salt water on the weekends I'd go up to Lake Naivasha in North Kenya and I would swim for eight hours at a time You've got to make the training as realistic as possible so open water wherever I could. When I got to the UK, I did lots of cold water training. I practiced swimming at night. I'd go out in rough conditions. I'd go in, out in smooth conditions. Every day I'd kind of go down to the beach and I'd just swim parallel to the coastline, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Only allowed to wear swimming trunks. Wetsuits are not allowed because they help insulate you from the cold. When Captain Matthew Webb first swam across the English Channel, all he had was a pair of swimming trunks. So you're not allowed anything else. You're not allowed watches, you're not allowed any music or iPods, you know, earphones. So that's why I wore, I wore swimming trunks. It's not normally what I swim in. Um, obviously you normally wear board shorts or whatever. <laughs> I don't respond too well to the cold. Obviously water is a great conductor of heat. So if you go in the water um, and you're not able to insulate yourself, you will start to go down with hypothermia. First tried to swim across the channel, uh, no, not swim across, just do a training session in the channel. I only managed half an hour in the water. My second time I managed an hour and a half. Uh, and then once I started to put on weight and I built up my resistance to the cold, I managed to last the 15 hours needed to get me across. Yeah. Everything I had uh, was to try and make me as cold as I, I could be. And I switched from swimming in the channel to just standing in the channel. So I'd go out till I was about neck height just so that I could touch the bottom and I'd stand for two, three hours at a time. I knew that, like I say, the cold was no longer an issue when I was swimming because I was generating that body heat through the swim. So then I just had to stand there. And, and yeah, that got incredibly boring. But So no hot showers, so cold showers only, no hot drinks, made myself as cold as I could, and then just stood in cold water, ice baths, and then and then just, yeah, just standing in, in it's cold water for as long as I could. <laughs> I used a form of Vaseline called lanolin. It's a like a sheep wax or a sheep a sheep Vaseline from the the wax on the wall. I'm not 100% sure, but it doesn't provide any insulation. It's purely to stop the chafing, even under your arms, under your legs. So I just covered myself in that just to stop that chafing from happening. <laughs> I didn't actually choose to swim at night. I have to wait for your weather window and you have to wait for your tidal window. And these are totally determined by, well, by nature, but then you have your boat pilot that chooses the best time for when you're going to swim. You can't swim across uh, against the tide. You have to wait for the tide so it to be pulling you out of England and then you've got that crossover and then for the tide to be sucking you back into France. The boat pilot rang me and said, where are you ready to go or do you want to go at nine o'clock? So I had three hours to kind of put my bags down, sort my kit out, make a few drinks up and then try and get some rest. I couldn't rest, I was too nervous. And that was it and then we went down and, and swam through the night. So it was just dusk as we were getting ready, dark as I got in. So I had no intention of going in the night. Luckily during my training I'd done some night swims, so I'd planned everything. <laughs> I jumped off the boat and then I had to swim to the beach and then start by walking into the water. When I was on the boat, I was anxious, nervous, scared, excited. Did I have it in me? Could I do it? What was going to happen? What were the conditions going to be like? How, was my training good enough? All these kind of thoughts that go through your head 
kind of the, the fear of am I going to be good enough then that was it and then I walked into the water and, and then set off from there and then it's like right you get that feeling that this is it there's no turning back now I've told everyone I'm going to do it I believe I'm going to do it I've done the right training let's just get on with it and kind of grit it out for the for the next few hours <laughs> So I had a support boat that went alongside. There was a representative from the Channel Swimming Association to check that everything was legit. I had two support people who were giving me food and drink every half an hour. And there was the boat pilot and his son who were working together to manage the trip. So on the boat, there were five people all together. It's very much a team event. I did swim it solo. I was the only one in the water at the time but it is 100% a team effort, and I could not do it without my coaches, without the boat pilot, without the support. Um, and that includes everyone that kind of that posted and, and watched and donated, it, it was a full team effort. Yeah. I'm gonna guess now, I'll, I'll post a picture up here, but I'm guessing it was probably around 15 meters long. So it wasn't a little rowing boat. I know when Matthew Webb first did it, it was a small rowing boat. Someone just giving him whiskey shots every now and again, but it was a fishing boat, just a, a regular fishing boat that you see down the harbor. So yeah, black currant juice with this fructose sugar. So it gave me a quick boost of energy. Um, I'd also have tin peaches. So if I felt like having a bit of solid, and then I'd also have a warm cup of tea with plenty of sugar again. I'd swim up to the boat, it was in a, on a fishing reel attached to a cup, and then she would pass me the cup. I would drink it as I was kind of treading water and I'd drift away from the boat, and then I'd throw the cup and carry on swimming. Not allowed to touch the boat at all, so I couldn't hold on to the boat, so it had to be on this fishing reel. <laughs> do go to the bathroom that's something that takes a bit of getting used to when you're swimming because you don't want to keep stopping I had no problem just kind of swimming peeing at the same time yeah. because the water is quite murky you can't really see anything that's that's going on you can't talk to anyone I had earplugs in just because I, um, to stop the water going into my ears it is uncomfortable but you get used to being by yourself uh, you kind of play mental games just to try and keep your brain active. I'd think about what I was going to have in my next half an hour feed. Things that you like to say that kind of boost yourself up. Think about why you're doing it. And a really good one is I'd think about my technique. Just think focusing on my hand position or focusing on my recovery or focusing on my head position when I breathe. And that really helped me to just focus, trying to make my stroke as efficient as possible. And then it's always a good option as well is to just try and think about nothing, trying to get into this kind of meditation state. And time goes very, very quickly. You just, like you do when you're in the shower or if you're on the loo for a while, you just kind of drift off and you just find yourself thinking about nothing and you, you've got this kind of free, free mind and that helps time go quickly as well. Yeah. There are lots of jellyfish and you do get stung by the jellyfish. Uh, if you've not been stung by a jellyfish before, it does it does sting, it does hurt quite a bit. But I wouldn't say I enjoyed it, but it was definitely something that broke up the monotony of swimming. Um, when I got stung by a jellyfish, that took my mind off my shoulders aching, or the boredom, or the cold, and it gave me something else to think about. So it happened for uh, probably about six or seven times I got stung by jellyfish, and each time it was a bit a bit of a bugger. It did hurt, but it, it took my mind off what I was doing and it gave me something else to think about for a bit. So I, I didn't mind it too much from that point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Whole swim, it's not an enjoyable experience. It is tough. But two memories really stick out as being as being quite, quite demoralising. As uh, the sun was coming up, I turned to my wife, Georgie, who was on the boat and said, right, and you shouldn't do this because it's never the answer you want to hear, but I said, how far are we? How close are we to France? And I thought I was in French waters, like I say, very close. And she said, you're not even halfway. So I'd not even got out of English waters. I'd swam all through the night. I was cold. I was demoralized. Uh, and to hear that when I thought I was three quarters of the way, to hear that I'm not even halfway was quite demoralizing. 
The second hardest time was probably the last three, four hours of swimming. Reason being, I was drifting along the coastline. Like even though I was swimming because of the shape of the coast, I was not actually getting any closer to France. The tides then started to change, so the boat pilot said, look, you've got to start swimming quicker if you, or you're not going to make it. So I then had to sprint for the last kilometre just to, to try and beat the tide. So I'd been bringing diesel fumes for around 12, 13 hours. So when I had to sprint for the last kilometre, my lungs were burning, they felt about the same size as a crisp packet, because not only is I exhausted, I've been breathing in these fumes, um, and that last bit of a swim was, re was really, really tough. <laughs> couldn't cry so I was that exhausted, that dehydrated. My legs didn't work very well so I had to crawl across up the beach and by this point it was kind of the middle of the day, I think it was 1pm uh, French time so people were just about there going about their daily business and then there's me obviously just craw crawling out of the water like some sea monster covered in sheep lanolin, um, whimpering and, and trying to stagger to my feet. So I got clear of the water, stood up I looked around for a couple of souvenirs, I kind of stuffed a couple of shells and a couple of rocks into my swimming trunks. And then I had to get back into the water uh, because the boat couldn't come all the way because it was a, a beach landing. So the boat sent a dinghy and I had to swim from the shore, having just swam for 15 hours, swim out to this dinghy, try and pull myself into the dinghy, which I was cramping up, my legs wouldn't work again. Um, and then from the dinghy back to the boat, I think it was around four hours back from France to England on the boat. I was absolutely exhausted uh, and I, I slept all the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My shoulders were sore because of the swimming. Um, they were sore for a few days and my tongue was wrinkly, like it started peeling. I could peel strips of skin off my tongue like a, like a snake skin. And that's just because of the salt water made it peel. But it finished peeling within a week, it didn't hurt. Uh, and like I say, after a few, four, three, four days, my shoulders were back to normal. I was obviously a bit fatigued, but mainly just ecstatic that it was done. I didn't have to do any more swimming. I didn't have to uh, get up and train. It was over and it felt brilliant. <laughs> So hopefully that's answered some of your questions. If you've got any more questions about any sort of um, long distance swim, long distance run, endurance challenge, please just fire them across, I'm happy to help. Uh, they all are always difficult, but they're always incredibly worthwhile. And I always find that the more time you put into training for something or however the big challenge is, whatever you set yourself, the more rewarding it is afterwards. And their memories, and experiences that you, you keep with you forever. But it's whatever you're doing, if you've set yourself a challenge and you've gone out there and you've approached it and you've planned and then you do it, it's, it gives you a great sense of uh, well-being, self-confidence, and it helps you approach new challenges um, with the same sort of confidence. So yeah, if you've got any questions, please fire them across. I'll see you next time.